Good afternoon, it's Debbie Evans and Rolo here. Not very much snow as yet in Berkshire, but we're not complaining about that. It's bitterly cold though. So today we're reading to you from the second book in the Secret Adventures of Rolo series. This one's the Chilvester Passage. And this is all about the market town of devices and um, an explanation as to the term moon raking. Right, settle down Rolo and off we go. I'd visited Devizes several times with the smiley lady and I knew the Wadworth Brewery Shire horses because I'd delivered a message to them on a previous adventure. On this occasion, however, the time tunnel brought me out at the side of St James's Church next to the pond known as the Crammer. I had no idea which century I was in and I started looking for clues. I couldn't see any sign of the big supermarket or even any cars. Wait a minute, there wasn't even a proper road, more of a cart track. What was evident was that it was very late at night. The full moon shone brightly, illuminating the scene. I think it's what's referred to as a hunter's moon. At first glance, there were not many people around. Not surprising due to the lateness of the hour, but then I spied a flurry, a flurry of activity around the pond. I edged a bit closer and hid behind a cart which was covered with heavy oilskin cloths. Closer inspection revealed that men and women in dark clothes were loading barrels into the pond. The wooden containers bobbed about for a few minutes on the surface and then the men, using a variety of long-handled farming implements, started moving them around. I had no idea what they were up to. Psst! I turned and saw some kind of spaniel beside me. He leant towards me and asked in a whispered tone, Are you with the excise men? I had no idea what he meant, so I shook my head. Good. The name's Tubbs. Mr Tubbs to you. We sniffed each other politely and I avoided eye contact with him as I didn't want to fight and I certainly didn't feel like deferring to him. What are they doing? I asked as casually as I could. They're hiding the brandy, replied Tubbs, or to be more precise, watering down the, the brandy. He gave me a cons conspiratorial wink. Oh dear, here comes trouble. Are you sure you're not with the excise men? The day has eyes, but the night has ears, he said. And when I looked puzzled, he tapped the side of his nose and said it was an old Scottish proverb. I assured him I wasn't with any excise men, whatever they were, and following him, I crawled under the cart and hid underneath the tarpaulin. Watch this, said Tubbs, and I put my head between my paws and peered out through a gap. Surely someone must have tipped them off. Hope it wasn't you. Some very officious looking men rode up at speed, dismounted their horses and demanded that everyone stop what they were doing at once and put their tools down in the name of the king. The trap door had mysteriously closed. Which king would that be? I casually whispered to my fellow fugitive. Why, George III, of course. Did you just get off a tea clipper? Tubbs hissed, no doubt puzzled by my ignorance. I thought I'd better be quiet and observe what was going on. What are you fellows doing at this late hour, as if we didn't know, demanded the man in charge, sporting a swirling cloak and a big menacing sword. One of the sharpest of the villagers pointed at the moon's round yellow reflection in the pond and said loudly, we're trying to catch yonder cheese. The men of Devizes picked up their rakes and demonstrated how they were using their rakes to catch the moon, stroking at the surface of the water. The excise men thought they had a right bunch of simpletons here. These villagers were considered to be a few shillings short of a guinea throughout the county, so they laughed amongst themselves, mounted their horses and rode off into the night, no doubt to try to surprise some other smugglers engaged in nocturnal activities. No cause for concern in devises then. When the coast was clear, the villagers resumed their moon raking and brought up barrel after barrel of fine French brandy, roped together and now slightly watered down by a dip in the crammer. 
but diluted to a strength that would be more palatable to the English taste and less likely to be detected as smuggled spirit at the point of sale in local inns. Tubbs enlightened me about smuggling, explaining that, owing to high taxation on luxury goods in Britain, many villagers all over the country had turned to illegal means of importing tobacco, tea and brandy. This particular hoard was a consignment of French brandy brought across the channel by ship and then driven inland by horse and cart for local distribution and hidden in passageways and even the pond. The price of brandy in France was a quarter of the price of a barrel in England. Former English governments had made themselves unpopular by putting taxes up higher and higher in order to pay for expensive wars in Europe and that was why many ordinary English folk became involved in smuggling in the first place. Hard-working men simply couldn't afford life's little luxuries and they thought the high taxation grossly unfair. Tubbs also told me that smuggled tobacco was often disguised at sea by twisting it into ropes to avoid detection by excise men as you would expect to find numerous coils of rope lying on the deck of a ship. The excise men rode around the country looking for nighttime activity which usually meant illegal imports and the rounding up of villagers who dodged paying their taxes. They'd certainly been killed in devices that night. Rolo's just telling me there's someone at the door. As we said our goodbyes, I told Tubbs I was curious about his name. He explained that he'd been born in a tub, which was another name for a barrel. He then gave me a miniature barrel with a rope tied to it, and I looped it around my neck. I would take it back to Athelstan as a souvenir of my smuggling adventure. I guess he would probably give it to Dar. The woodland man looked as if he might enjoy a tiny drop of 18th century brandy. I felt a bit like a St Bernard dog about to go on a mountain rescue. I'm just going to show you Chantal's drawing here of Rollo with a little barrel of brandy round his neck. I thanked the spaniel and was soon on my way back through the time tunnel to the foxhole entrance, but instead of going straight home, I went through the forest to see Athelstan. He seemed to be sleeping and awoke with a start. I didn't expect to see you tonight, little pup, he yawned, so I told him about my adventure and asked him about smuggling, as I found it quite fascinating and wondered how much of it still went on. The wise gatekeeper enlightened me. The outbreak of the Napoleonic Wars brought a halt to most smuggling activity because the trading nations England and France were suddenly at war. And then, in 1840, a free trade policy was introduced in Britain which lowered taxes and so reduced the need to smuggle goods. Athelstan's encyclopedic knowledge never failed to impress me. Was there anything this guardian didn't know? I wondered. <laughs> Don't stop kissing me. I recounted my adventure and he listened, nodding wisely. I gave him the small barrel and told him that now I knew why the good people of Devizes were called moonrakers. I scampered home and under the rickety gate up the garden steps, I'm sure I could hear the rabbits next door, but no time to investigate now. I snuck through the trapdoor, scattering bottles onto the kitchen floor as I jumped out from the cupboard under the sink. I quickly tidied them up and snuggled into my basket. I needn't have worried too much. Being winter, I had a few extra hours of adventure time as the sun had early nights and a lie-in at this time of year. And thankfully, so did the smiley lady. Now, I'm just going to read you the dog blog that follows this chapter. Throughout the series, Rolo blogs. These are things that happen in his everyday life. And this is just a short one, something that happened after this particular chapter. The smiley lady is quite nervous driving in the countryside at this time of year because she is scared of brown eyes in the hedge. This is because it's the time of year when the young male deer go a bit silly. They make an extraordinary barking noise when they are rutting, which means they are testing their newly grown velvet antlers by running at each other and headbutting. Sounds a bit daft to me. 
That's why if you are driving at night, particularly across the forest, and pick up eyes reflected in the hedgerow, it means there is usually at least one and probably several deer about to spring out in front of you and dent your car. This also happens a lot in springtime. Bang banging in the garden and barked so much I was shut inside the house with the curtains drawn so I couldn't see what was going on, but later inspection revealed a new fence. The neighbour's rabbits are once more out of sight. So there we're going to leave it for today. I'm sorry, there was quite a bit of activity going on here, which set Rolo off. Um, I'll be back tomorrow with another chapter from The Secret Adventures of Rolo. And uh, thank you very much for listening. And we hope that you'll join in again tomorrow. Bye for now.